step two. Uh, so the committee asked me to present on the step and I was very honored with that request. And I'm glad to share with you how step two works for me. Um, my thought is to talk about where my early struggles were with step two. When I first joined program, getting close to seven years ago now and take a little bit of a break and then we'll uh, come back and I'll share with you how I use step two in my day to day living now that I've got some some experience with recovery. So when I got to program, um, I got to program because my wife at the time decided I was an alcoholic and demanded that I come to recovery, uh, specifically AA. It was at one, at, on one side, I was desperate to save my marriage, so I agreed. And then on the other side, I was very, um, very unsure about the likelihood of success because I, my father was, uh, he was an AA member and had been sober from before my earliest memories, but he was still a jerk. I, I had my thoughts about 12 step and whether or not it would work for me. Uh, the simple fact was I was on, I was not on a winning streak and I was in a lot of pain. I was running my life 24 seven on my own will. And it was exhausting. I mean, I would wake up in the morning from a restless night's sleep and it would take me forever to get out of bed and even get going. And then there'd be the concerns of what's happening at work. And then I'd be running around like a cat with a uh, you know, long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. And I'd be exhausted at the end of work day. And oh, I had to get to the bar to have a beer or two and relax before I went home because that was a pressure cooker too. Uh, you know, I, I would spend a few hours with my wife at the time and I, you know, I'd, I'd try to fall asleep and the mind would be running. I, it was just a nonstop energy drain trying to do it my way. The one thing that was very beneficial for me early in my recovery was that um, I, 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 I realized for myself that my way was not working. I was not happy. I, and I had no idea how to turn the ship around. I was done. I was beaten into submission by the emotional pain that I was going through day in and day out. I was also fortunate enough to realize that whether I, I, I started attending meetings because of someone else's request, but I realized early enough, I, I realized after about three months that whether my marriage survived or not, there were some ideas here that I could use for myself. And that was, that was very important for me to, uh, to, to establish my commitment to doing this program. You know, my, my first meeting at, at CODA, I immediately felt home. You know, I read those list of characteristics and good codependent that I was, I registered myself about 44 out of 55 characteristics. And I registered my wife's with like 42 or 43. And I also inventoried my father with like 47 or 48. So I was right for this program, let me tell you. Um, but I knew something had to change. And since I was the common element 
in all of these different relationships that were struggling, I figured I would start on my side. And that was a suggestion that I was given. So let me go to my screen share. We'll go over to, where's my PowerPoint? Here's, okay, share. You come here and we'll start. So I started program because of relationships. And I, it, there, the one part of my brain needs to make things a little bit easier for me to visualize. And looking at relationships. There we go. Almost, Almost like we're in the same room. <laughs> okay, can you see me now? <laughs> yes, we got it. Excellent. Okay, so I started program because of relationships that were struggling. And uh, for me, I, I, I like to simplify <laughs> things that um, it's easier for me to visualize. So this little relationship uh, status square help me to identify where my relationships were and in what state they were. Now, with my wife at the time, I was attached under the same roof and there was a lot of anger. And this was a, a very dangerous and hurtful place not only for me, but for her and anyone that I was around. And because I was such a large piece of my life, that anger was spilling out in a lot of my other relationships. My father and I were detached in anger. And I, I'm going to be talking a lot about my father because I, when, when, I started program, I was extremely judgmental of my father um, because as I grew up, the example that I had from him was when you go outside the front door, you know, it better be smiles. And as his son, I better not do anything to embarrass him. Um, so I grew up very attentive to the hypocrisy of the words that come out of somebody's mouth and then the actions that, that uh, don't necessarily, you know, reflect what those words are. Um, and I had a really good example of, you know, thoughts being one thing and words being one thing on the outside in public and then being very, very different in private behind closed doors. So I became very suspicious of what anybody would say. And he was the first authority that I had uh, in my life, but he was not the only one. I mean, as I got into school and as I got into the workforce, I had plenty of other examples where there were people who had authority over me that words and actions didn't necessarily match. The, the next place is to be detached in love. And as I got into, you know, the work, this was something that I heard in program was, it to detach and love and it sounded fantastic i had no clue how to move people from being detached in anger to detached in love this was one of my first struggles and you know the the greatest place in the world to be is to have a relationship that is based on love and respect and support and nurture and to have that person in your life. And this was something that I had longed for, but I didn't know how to, you know, do my part 
to get a relationship into this square of the relationship status. But I had to really start with my relationship with God. One of the, um, one of the shares that I heard early on was that the way the steps are set up is steps one, two, and three is to get into a relationship with a higher power. And for me, when I started looking at my relationship with higher power, the, the first thought was, okay, there is no higher power. And for me, the way that, that came into place was I actually, I, I, I did, I, I believed that there was a higher power, but I immediately um, decided that he had no impact on my life. I decided what God could or could not do, and I decided that he couldn't come down and resolve my problems. So there is something out there that, you know, hit the big red button and started the big bang and started this universe on its course. So I knew that there was something there that I couldn't explain, but I also said he couldn't come in and help me out. So this was where my struggle was with step two, the first time around was to let him out of the box. And when, for me to do that, one of the things that I had to do was come up with, with a prayer that would help me because I had worked so hard for so many years saying that God is not out there. He doesn't have influence over me. What I had to do was take a leap of faith. And um, the, the prayer that I came up with was, I don't know who or what you are. I don't know what you can or can't do. I don't know what you will or won't do for me. What I do know is that in this moment, I'm in trouble and I'm asking for your help. That was, that, that was me forcing myself, driving myself, that gift of desperation, that pain and anguish that I was tired of and I had to try something new. <clears throat> for me, that was, that was the prayer that, that I had to reach for because I had been playing God for so long. I had been judging other people right and wrong, good and bad. I was judging myself right and wrong, good and bad. I was, um, my thoughts in my head were critical, condescending. And if you had no influence over me, all oh, that sarcasm would come out in a heartbeat. But, you know, I, I had to find a way to kind of crack that shell. The pain was there. I was busting at the seams. You know, when I read step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. I had questions about my belief. I didn't believe, I, you know, for so many years, I didn't believe he could do anything. And I was, it was suggested to me, instead of working so hard to believe that he can't do, <clears throat> consider the possibility that maybe he can, maybe he can't. Um, one of the other struggles that I had was with the wood, with the word could, because a lot of times I would, I, I would superimpose the, the, the word should or would. Those were reflections of my disease because maybe there is a higher power, but could he? Maybe there is a higher power, but would he or should he? Does he have a responsibility 
for me to, for, to me to help me get out of the predicament I was in. Um, the, the, the biggest phrase for me that I struggled with was power greater than myself because for so many years, I had plenty of examples of people that had power over me, my father, my bosses. When I was a student, you know, I was in ROTC and I was going to get a commission and I was going to get my degree and I was going to work as a rocket scientist. And there was somebody that had power over me and completely knocked me out of my career path. Mm -hmm. So bouncing back and forth with authority and power, um, this is what program tells me is that higher power is there and that he will love me and he will support me and he will forgive me for my sins. And I wanted that, but how do I get there? The The struggles that I had with step two were of my own making because my ego was telling me that what I had done to certain people was unforgivable, that um, I didn't have the power to change my reaction mode, you know, I, I, I realized that I, I was stuck in that fight or flight mode, that black and white thinking. Mm -hmm. And when I, once I realized that my best thinking got me here, then my sponsor suggested stop believing so hard that he won't do it for you. <clears throat> Try it. What have you got to lose? And that's where my prayer, I don't know who or what you are. I don't know what you can or can't do. And I don't know what you will or won't do. But in this moment, I'm going to try. I'm going to ask you for help. It was a leap of faith it was what it was. I took that leap because I was emotionally desperate for something, anything to relieve the pain. And <clears throat> it was a turning point for me. The, um, <clears throat> when I was able to do that, and, and, and I had to do it in the smallest of windows because, you know, I would, I would say that once and I'd let it, things go for about half an hour. And then I would get on the road and somebody would cut me off on the road. And I'm like, Arr! um, so I'd have to say it again, you know, that step one, two, three dance, I was right there. I, I had to do it over and over and over again. Um, but the more I did it, the easier I got. You know, the, and I didn't necessarily see how it impacted me in the short term. I look back and I can realize it did. I, I do remember that one of the first things that I was relieved of was judging strangers. Um, they didn't have any impact over me. And when I was able to slow down, when I hit that pause and then took that prayer, I was able to remember that I don't know their story any more than they know mine. You know, when I, as far as the, the, the road rage, the, the frustration that I had with strangers on the road, 
I remembered a story from when I was growing up. So as a teenager, I'm in the middle of three boys and my older brother is a good three and a half years older than me, which means he has, he had size and weight. Um, and there's no way I could compete with him on that level. One day I was on my way home and he was, I, I was a freshman in high school and Jeff was a senior and for whatever reason, he was just, you know, telling me about what I had to do when we got home. You have to do this. You have to do that. He's telling me, and it's like, you know, I didn't have a good day at work. I just want a break. Give me a few minutes. And he just, uh, that's where he was that afternoon, that day, whatever. But it was a perfect storm because he was, he was riding me and I was not going to be ridden that day. So I get to my room and I go to close the door. I know I've got to do these things. You know, the, I was a latchkey kid. My brothers and I took care of chores growing up from a very young age. So I knew I had to do them and I was willing to do them. I just wanted to wait 10, 15 minutes. Well, he puts his foot in the door, pushes the door open, doesn't give me my space. I'm not going to fight him, but I'm a do it yourself kind of guy. I will find a solution. So I go over to my handy dandy backpack cause I was in scouts and I had a survival knife kind of in that style of Rambo, which was big back in the early eighties. And I pull it out of my backpack and I unsheath it and turn it around. He left the doorway. I closed the door and I turned on my music. My younger brother calls my mom. The point of the story, my mother made a 15 minute trip home in about seven minutes. I'm sure there were a few traffic violations, moving violations for her on the way home in that space of time. And I remember today in recovery, I don't know that person's story. I don't know if it's a husband driving his pregnant wife to the hospital. I don't know if it's a mother driving home because her kids are fighting. Sure, he could be a jerk. She might be not paying attention. There is that possibility, but I don't know. And that's just it. HP knows. HP has got each of us. Not me. Not Chris J. So, you know, forget the statistics. That's what I learned. Forget the statistics. The reality is I don't know. And more than that, it's not my responsibility not my business to know what's going on with everybody. But I have a problem with authority. I have a problem with somebody telling me what I should or shouldn't do. And who is the biggest authority except HP. So this is where the leap of faith comes in. This is where the suggestion other people's definitions don't have to be yours. You can pick and choose what you like. And for me, I, you know, part of the reason I was judgmental of my father was because when I was in high school, he pursued a second career and became a minister. So now there is a minister in my family. I'm a preacher's kid, and I see the the man underneath the the robes. You know, I see that how he treats his congregation being so different from how he treats his family, and it'll be 20 years ago this June. My father 
minister, beloved by his congregation, sent me and my brothers a letter and said, I don't want you in my life. I have not had a civil war with my father in just short of 20 years now. And there was a lot of detached with anger around my father. A lot of it. And it was, it, it poisoned how I treated my wife, poisoned how I treated my peers. It poisoned how I looked at myself. And yet at the same time, I started doing the same thing. My words were one thing and my actions were another. And that was the honesty that I got in step four. But before I could get to, to that, I had to be willing to try it. So my first pass with step two was purely an act of faith and purely a desperate move to get out of where I was. That is where a sponsor and a safe meeting were instrumental for me because I had gotten honest that my best thinking was getting me nowhere. I was completely desperate that I had to do something else and I had no idea what. And it was the safety of the meetings and the one-on-one -on -one coaching and sharing and support and challenge is like, stop believing so hard something that hasn't worked. Try something new. You know, the, the, the definition, I, you know, I don't like people telling me I'm bad. I don't like people telling me I'm insane. I don't like people telling me anything. But because I was in so much pain, I was like, okay, somebody please throw me a lifeline. And that was the suggestion. It's like, there is a lifeline. Stop working, you know, to say it can't happen and be open to maybe it will, maybe it won't. So I took that leap. I found my prayer. That was a prayer that worked for me. You know, I'm, I've heard other people share what their step two prayer was. You know, I, I truly believe that mix and match, take what you like, take what works for you. And once you find what works, grab hold of it. Because when I took it without any expectations, different things started to happen. And once those different things started to happen, then things started turning around. So step two, first time around, was just hanging on to the desperation and hanging on to my support group around these rooms. So, <laughs> like to have a little bit of a breakout at this point and invite everyone to share what their thoughts of step two. Um, if you're early in recovery and having those same struggles, if you have uh, some experience in recovery and you're thinking back to where your first, you know, first time looking at step two is, I'd like you all to, take a chance and, and revisit that period of your recovery. Okay. Oops, can't do that. Chris, how long would you like us to be in breakouts? You think? Um, I'm thinking, uh, let's take 15 minutes. Okay, great. So, so everybody gets a good three minutes. And if it's a little bit over, we're all good with that. Okay. All right, so um, so how now that I've got uh, now that I've taken that first leap of faith, and I am 
consciously looking and trying and saying, um, okay, maybe there's something, maybe there's not, but I'm willing to ask today. Um, that leap of faith got me going. And when I started moving forward with my recovery, um, let's see, let's say get over here. We'll do this share. Okay. So can everybody see my relationship with God screen? Now, can you see my cursor also bouncing back and forth? Yes. Okay. So before I got made too much more struggle, that, that leap of faith got me out of, there is no higher power. It got it, that leap of faith helped me to let God out of the box, out of the closet. And I started looking for a higher power that wor was working with me. And my early part of recovery, going through steps four and five, I'm bouncing back and forth between an angry God that's punishing me or um, low self-esteem that's telling me I'm not worthy of his time or attention. So my, my character defects kept me down here at the bottom, bouncing back and forth between, um, you know, my character defects, whether I'm judging someone else, you know, if, if HP is out to get me, well, I'm going to get my piece before he gets my, gets it out of me. Or it's low self-esteem that, you know, he's not going to give me anything because I've already burned my bridge with him. The whole one and done thing was um, uh, that that was a concept that I never did buy from religion. Uh, but another thing I heard in my recovery early was religion is something that people choose when they don't want to go to hell. Spirituality is a choice by people who have been to hell and don't want to go back. And that's exactly where I was because I didn't want to go back to where I was. Um, some of, some of my thing, so, some of my struggle as a codependent is to judge others. And that was a red flag for me. So when I felt that judgment came up and I, I said that prayer, um, one by one, uh, I would turn that over. Um, the big one was my father. And I'm going to go back here. Doo, doo, doo. Okay. So with my father... And I was detached in anger with him. That was my big challenge was to move him out of being detached in anger with my father to detached in love. And it was a dilemma. I, I had to fight for this piece. And there was a number of miracles that happened in my life to move my father from that section C into that section B. Um, the simple fact was I, it, it, it was my big hurdle. It was a watershed moment for me. I had to realize that um, if I wanted to detach in love with him, I had to get rid of my judgment. And in order for me to get rid of my judgment, I had to, um, I, I had to turn around and say, um, God, he's not who I wanted as my father. I don't know why you gave me him as my father, but in order for me to live, I have to let him go. And I had, what, what I realized was that I didn't accept my father for who he was. I was so pissed off from people who didn't accept me for who I was. And yet I was doing the same thing with my father. And I had to realize 
he was a human being, that he had strengths and weaknesses, and I had to let him be who he was. His choice did have consequences for me, but they had consequences for him also. And letting go of my father and letting go of my judgment of my father was how I was able to move him from detached in love or from detached in anger into detached with love. And once I was able to do that around my father, then I was able to do it for myself. And then the thing pieces started to line up. So, um, more to come, but how about we take like a five minute break? So I'm going to go back to, um, my little PowerPoint share. Okay, from current slide and make this big. Okay. Are you seeing the okay, good. So yep. I'm gonna yep. scoot on ahead. Okay, so I need to figure out what works for me. And one of the things that was shared with me was um, a ladder. Before I was in recovery, I was on the life ladder and I was jealous of people who were higher on the ladder and condescending to people who were lower on the ladder. And it was a fight to get further up or feel it when somebody would kick me down the ladder. Uh, this spiritual ladder, the serenity ladder works for me today. Um, when, when I look at this ladder, I, I have to start with being honest with myself, which that I, that encapsulates uh, step one for me. My life is unmanageable. That's getting honest. Um, step two is about being open that there is a higher power out there that, um, could restore me to, to sanity. And step three is being willing. It's like, okay, HP, it's yours. I'm turning it over. Now, when I, when I am willing to do that, then I am taking a step towards faith and having faith is where my prayer, I don't know what you will or won't do, but I'm going to trust you to guide me, to give me the opportunities to recover, um, give me opportunities to practice my recovery. When I am in trust with my higher power, I'm, I'm in a good place. I, I, I don't care what other people are judging me up and down. That's their business. If whenever I'm disturbed, I am somewhere down this ladder. Either I, I, I may not have gotten, I may not have fallen all the way down, but I'm not trusting my higher power. So when, when I recognize that I am struggling for whatever reason, I try to figure out, I, I need to slow down and I need the quick reminders to, um, to get me back on track. So there's the three P's. This is a big one for me because if I am reacting to life, I'm not hitting pause. Uh, the, the pause is really important for me because if I am, if I'm running full steam ahead, um, you know, there are things out there, the vast majority of things in my life, I don't have to 
react to in the moment because I've learned that if I react, I am in judgment. I am taking higher powers place. So I need to slow down and I need to check in what is going to, what, what works for me. And for me, part of my prayer is to accept things. I didn't put it in here, but the serenity prayer um, works for me very well as what my hula hoop is. You know, the, I, I, I need the serenity to accept things as they are and the courage. Three, the accept part is a huge piece for me because if I'm, if I'm hurting and I jump into action, then um, I have a tendency to use either fight or flight. Um, instead of making a choice, I, I either hurt people because they're hurting me or I get the hell out of the situation and um, avoid it. And that's not always, that, that's not good for me. The reason of acceptance is so important for me, and I learned this with my father, was that if I can accept the situation as it is, then um, I can make a choice. I ask myself two questions. What is safe and healthy for me? And how do I do this respectfully? Um, because I, I, I have a primary purpose and part of my primary purpose is to treat others with respect and compassion. Um, I know for myself that I was, I was hurt a lot of times because people were not respectful to me, whether they meant it in a mean way or not. Um, they, the, the feelings I had were either people were jumping to conclusions. They don't know my story, but they're telling me what I have to do. Um, and if I can accept that, um, you know, the situation for what it is, then I can be respectful. I can make a suggestion and say, this is something that I have found helpful instead of saying, no, 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 you, you're not supposed to feel this. So you're supposed to do that so that you don't feel this. It is not my business to tell people what their solution is. I can share what works for me, but telling someone, I, I, I know when people told me what to do, whether I loved them or not, it is like a knee jerk reaction. Don't tell me what to do. You know, give me a choice. And with eight, when I accept the situation as it is, then I can make a choice. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's dukes up. Um, this was another one that was really good for me, was faith or fear. Pick enough. Because if I choose faith, if I choose my higher power, then I, I have the opportunity of letting someone feel their own consequences. Uh, I have the ability to um, accept people. When I'm afraid of someone or a situation, then I'm operating on my will, not higher powers will. So the fear or faith, that's one of those sobering questions that helps me to reconnect. I have chosen faith often enough now in recovery that um, I know faith is a better choice. Sometimes that fear is so strong, I, 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 I go to that fearful place, but um, I don't like staying there. I, 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 
I have enough positive experiences when I choose faith that my courage is growing to trust my higher power more often. You know, but life happens quickly. Sometimes I need the really, really short reminders to get me back on track. So my steps one, two, and three, the really abridged virgin is step one, I can't. Step two, HP can. And step three is to let them. You know, when, when, I'm, when I'm in a meeting and I am in a safe place, I don't feel that pressure, I can take things slow. When I'm out, uh, when I'm outside the rooms, when I'm at work, when I'm in the stores or wherever in public, life happens a little bit quicker. And sometimes that's what I need is a short reminder to say, I can't, he can let him. And it does, it, it has helped me because my, my mouth will go. I mean, sometimes things happen and I'm like, ah, and I have to put the spiritual duct tape on. <laughs> I need to slow down. I need to hit that pause. And my really abridged steps help me. It is such a quick prayer. It helps me get to acceptance. And then when I am in acceptance, then I can make a choice. Um, you know, my, the, the way I lived life before I got into recovery, I had a hammer. It was my will and I would force my will. And I, that was all I had. Now I had the little one pound hammer to tap nails in, and then I had the sledgehammer, and then I had the jackhammer. I had a bunch of different hammers, but it was all just a hammer. You know, I prefer to live life with a full toolbox, with screwdrivers and wrenches, and I still have my hammer, it's there. Um, but I've got a whole bunch more. It's, it's kind of like having a full team of, uh, of, of defensemen in front of me, because sometimes life comes at me from the right. And sometimes it comes at me from the left. Sometimes I have to call and talk to my sponsor. Sometimes I need a meeting. Okay. Sometimes I have to get to my safe place. Having a safe place at home is so important. I know what my life was like when I didn't have a safe place where I would lay my head down. You know, having a safe place at home is so important to me. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, I've, I've got a bunch of different ones. And, and the, these are the, the ones that help me the most. They are my strongest tools. Um, they support each other. Sometimes I remember the three P's first. Sometimes I remember pick an F first. But the, what works for me is having a choice and selecting what I need in that moment. You know, there's so few things in my life that I have to do instantaneously. It's like, you know, I'm I'm not a human doer, I'm a human being. Sometimes I just have to be. Sometimes I have to feel the feeling and then say, okay, God, I have this feeling, but... I don't want to act on it because I'm going to hurt myself. I'm going to hurt someone else. So please help me step back. Sometimes I actually have uh, one experience in my life where my anger came up and it was obvious and it was at my boss, the owner of my company. And that anger, I'm sure, was in my eyes and in my body language. 
However, in that moment, I was able to recognize the promises because what I did was I spoke my truth and I told my boss, we were here three months ago and I'm doing right now what you just, right? Okay, let, let, let me describe it. My, I, I have an immediate supervisor and then I have the owner of the company. And once, let, let's say, I think it was like in, in May or so, my boss and I disagreed. And finally, my, my supervisor, the general manager said, fine, do it your way. And then the owner, came, he reported it to the owner. And then three days later, the owner came over to me and said, okay, if you two don't disagree and it doesn't have to happen instantaneously, then, then you wait and you talk to me. And then the three of us will make a decision. I said, okay, we'll do it that way. And three months later, that's what happened. Gordon and I disagreed and I said, okay, Gordon, here we are. Let's wait for Kurt to get back and we'll talk to him on Friday. So I go into this three-way meeting and then Kurt says to me, you know, if you got, if you two can't work this out, I don't know why I even have you as a project manager. Oh, was I pissed. But what I said, and I looked at him, probably with daggers, but I looked mm -hmm. at him and I said, you told me to bring this to you. We agreed to bring this to you. I'm doing what you told me to do. And that was it. That's all I said. I didn't take his inventory. I didn't make it a sarcastic statement. I just reminded him he asked for an agreement i gave it and i'm following the agreement i spoke my truth i did not bash my 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 the owner of my company and for the first time in seven years kurt sat back in his chair and literally zipped it i took a deep breath and I went back to the discussion. I didn't belabor it. I didn't point out anything further. We made a decision. And as the meeting was breaking up, Kurt said to me, okay, sounds like we're done. I said, yep, we are. I know what I'm going to do now. It's like, okay, you were right, Chris, you did what I asked you to do. And I want to work better with you on our communication so that we don't get back here again. None of my feelings are wrong. How I unload those feelings is my choice. And when I'm working with my higher power, I make better choices. So I need all of these and I use them when and how I need. I need that pause so I can revisit what is going on. <clears throat> I need that acceptance so I can make healthy choices. I need the faith to take a leap of faith and trust my higher power. It's happened often enough now during recovery that I can bank on a different reaction. I may not know where it ends up. I still have to let go of results, but I've done it often enough now when things are easy it has led to fantastic different outcomes than where I was before. The more I practice step two saying, okay, God, I don't know what you're going to do, who you are, what you will. The results have been so much better in my life. 
that I am finding myself in that place of faith and trust more often. I, I, I don't pick and choose what my favorite steps are. They each have so much value in my life. I don't know what I'd be doing without them. But whenever life blows up on me, steps are my anchor. I remember that I can't. I remember that he can. So once I remember that he can, then I can make a choice to let him, let HP. So with that, thank you all for letting me share how step two works in my life. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you, Chris.